Hi, I'm Rachel, and I'm here to do my Friday Reads video for August 17th, 2018. So, as usual, I'll start with what I uh, read since last week, and this is The Immortalists by Chloe Benjamin. I said in my last video that I just uploaded uh, that I had a lot of uh, feelings and uh, existential crisis about this book. <laughs> I'm trying to, I'm going to try to be quick with it because I have a lot to go through here, but. Uh, this book uh, came out earlier this year. It's a literary fiction novel about four siblings who, in 1969, go to see a fortune teller who tells them all the days of their deaths. And then the novel continues in vignettes throughout uh, the next uh, 40 years and tracks each of the siblings uh, as they confront life and death, to try to stay out of spoilery territory here. <laughs> um, it's a book that my book club picked to be our next uh, pick uh, for our meeting in the end of the month because uh, it's actually a Jewish themed book. Uh, I am part of a Jewish book club and uh, when I got this book I actually didn't think there'd be a whole lot of Jewish content. I knew the family was technically Jewish but I didn't think it would be a very Jewish book but I was very surprised. I thought this uh, was an incredibly Jewish book. I mean there were constant references to uh, going to synagogue and to the father who uh, studied Talmud on his own and uh, as each of the siblings went through life they um, each at least considered Judaism and considered uh, their upbringings and saw themselves as uh, very Jewish people and, and this is a very spiritual book obviously because we're talking about life and death and uh, I thought the ways that it confronted life and death felt very Jewish like one of the uh, brothers uh, started uh, trying to take Jewish classes or something in adulthood and then he got frustrated because so much of the uh, emphasis in Judaism is on this world, not the world to come. So uh, there's that. And then the, the two sisters in particular really touched me uh, in how they uh, tried to understand the mysteries of life and death. Uh, and uh, one of them was a magician and she really wanted to uh, probe that line between uh, reality and illusion and uh, uh, just the way that Benjamin talked about it, just it just spoke to me so much because I, I feel like I'm like that myself. I'm not somebody who is purely rational and logical and scientific. I feel like there's a larger truth in fiction and in religion and in, in to, to things that can't be so easily explained away by logic. And uh, so uh, Benjamin uh, puts that all into Clara's story. And then the other sibling uh, is a much more irrational and scientific, uh, but uh, she also uh, believes in the power of words and the power of stories, and she's sort of like maybe the main narrator in a way. <laughs> she uh, is in the story the longest and uh, has to deal the most with what's happened, and uh, I'm just going to get into spoilers, I think, but uh, th her part made me cry. I mean, it's only the second book this year that really made me teary, I think, because of how she talks in the, the book about loss, and then there's another subplot having to do with uh, Varya, the older sister, who um, works uh, at a research lab where they're studying um, primates, and uh, she has a relationship with uh, one of the primates, and it just it was very maternal, and they were both sort of lost souls, and that really just made me seize up a lot. So I'd be reading this book, and I just feel so emotionally connected to the themes and to the emotional character stuff. But at the same time, I'd get frustrated sometimes because I do ultimately think that uh, this whole idea of a mystery woman telling you the day that you're going to die is kind of a cop-out. And I feel like maybe something would have been more beautiful and genuine if instead of them careening toward a specific day of death that, uh, you know, things just happen in life, you know, good things and bad things, and that they, I don't know, have more agency to deal with it that way. I mean, it just, uh, the whole fate being out of your hands thing, uh, you know, it's, she tried to skirt around it but really wasn't entirely able to because of the premise of the story. And then there were just a couple of other things, like the fact that each of the vignettes took place several uh, years or decades apart made the characters feel less connected than I hoped to, and, I mean, that's part of what it actually is for them, the siblings ultimately, uh, you know, diverge and aren't as connected as they used to be, but just in general, I think there was so much uh, time in between them that uh, they didn't feel as fleshed out as I hoped. And then, you know, there was a couple of just random stuff in some storylines that, uh, especially, uh, especially Daniels and Varias, I think that felt a little contrived in a way and uh, like a gotcha part of uh, 
Varya's storyline and a relationship she had. And I think Benjamin got a little, a little too heavy handed with her message about embracing life a little bit in that final section. But overall, I really do think she nailed it. And I think that the other siblings, Simon and Clara, their sections uh, felt the most genuine in a way about uh, what they were saying about their life's journeys. And uh, I just so I felt a lot. <laughs> and uh, I'm not sure what to write about it in my review. And uh, I'm pretty sure when I go to my book club, uh, they always tend to be a little more shady about the books that we read. I'm, I'm, I, I like books more than <laughs> I give more float glowing reviews, I think, and uh, than they do. And I'm less skeptical about it. Uh, and this one, I think, is one of the top books that I've read for the book club, but they might bring me back down to earth. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> this is the next book I want to read. Uh, this is Meg Wallitzer's first published book, Sleepwalking, uh, because this month uh, I have a personal project in mind where I have this book and two of her other novels that uh, she wrote at the beginning of her career. And once I read them and review them, I will have read her entire backlist. And so it's a project that I've been working toward for the past couple of years, actually, and I have some videos where I review six of her other books, and so I'll link them down below. But I will read from the back about this one. Published when she was only 23 and written while she was a student at Brown, Sleepwalking marks the beginning of Meg Wallitzer's acclaimed career. Filled with her usual wisdom, compassion, and insight, Sleepwalking tells the story of the three notorious death girls, so called on the Swarthmore campus because they dress in black and are each absorbed in the work and suicide of a different poet, Sylvia Plath, Anne Sexton, and Wallitzer's creation, Lucy Asher, a gifted writer who drowned herself at 24. At night, the death girls gather in a candlelit room to read their heroine's works aloud. But an affair with Julian, an upperclassman, pushes sensitive and struggling Claire Danziger, she of the Lucy Asher obsession, to consider what degree of her death girl identity is really who she is. As she grapples with her feelings for Julian, her own understanding of herself and her past begins to shift uncomfortably and even disturbingly. Finally, Claire takes drastic measures to confront the facts about herself that she's been avoiding for years. I, as I went through this, I feel like that's like giving away all of the plot. It kind of sounds like it. This is this is a uh, reprint edition. They did this cover because it kind of looks like Wallitzer's cover for The Interestings uh, and The Female Persuasion, which are her latest two books, and both are very critically acclaimed. So I think I like this cover with the like wisping, colorful. Uh, candlelight from the candle, but uh, I guess they feel like because this book is uh, over 20 years old that they can get away with telling us the entire plot. That kind of sucks, <laughs> but that's okay. This is literary fiction. I'm in it for the characters. I am I'm good to go. <laughs> And finally, I wanted to indulge in another one of my personal projects, which I uh, glomped from another booktuber, actually. But uh, every now and then, I like to do the page 112 tag. Uh, the page 112 tag was started by Sean the Book Maniac on his channel. He took it from a uh, French award where um, to make a short list or a long list, they just read page 112 of every considered novel. And because you're sort of past all of the uber polished pages and you don't have much context, you really have to judge a book by the quality of the writing alone on that one page. And so I've been using the page 112 pet tag to pit two books against each other at a time that have been on my Goodreads TBR for years. And so I think to myself, OK, I'll read one and discard the other one because <laughs> there's too much to read. <laughs> So anyway, I choose books with a similar theme, and uh, as usual, <laughs> my theme is uh, multi-generational Jewish families. <laughs> so here we go. I will read from two books, page 112, starting with this book. This is Sunday Jews by Hortense Kalischer. You don't approve of our asking her to come along? She's careful nowadays to say we are. The one noticeable change in Peter, to anyone used to him, is that he avoids statements, lacks opinions, that wash of his commentary, smooth as pebbles, once prized because they came from an ocean floor. On the contrary, why not? At our age, we begin to crave the company of anybody from the young, to bring in what we ain't no longer. And she's got a head on her, that lady. The insurance? For what Lev had in the safe and from what he owed personally and what he didn't, she told us where to find. All that and good intentions toward Lev's boys. She would only take so much of what Lev left her. Such a little. Because you haven't been around long enough, I asked her. 
You're a wife in the courts. You're a wife in heaven, too. And she gave me the damnedest, the second cigar puffs on. She said, Jews don't expect a heaven. Good Jews are bad. He sighed. These sobra women, the ones born there, they scare the daylights out of me. My dentist has one, the hygienist. I said to her, seems like I spit an awful lot of blood in this process. And she says, quiet as a mouse or a cobra, you should. He laughs. She does too. Oh, Norman, she has your number. Come on, to them what's wrong with us is that we never had any of those numbers on the wrist from the camps. Anyway, I say to Deborah, Lev wasn't maybe much of a Jew, but he wasn't a bad one. And she did give me my comeuppance. Cigars are anecdotal for men of Norman's generation, and fraternal, of course. How? She howled, Lev wasn't a bad anything, and rushed from the room, and then rushed back in, like on a beeline. Norman is smoothing a glossy shoe tip on the rug, though no ash has dropped there, and snarls at me, why don't you break down and marry Jenny? The rocker she's sitting in almost dumps her. Keep the feet on the floor, under our noses, that's a first shock. Then this immediate proprietary jealousy, as for a chattel thought, to be owned. I mean, so this is uh, the second time that I've read through this, and I just found it very difficult to get through this page. Uh, a lot of it is a big paragraph uh, that's said by the character Norman as he is uh, relaying conversations that he had with other people to the narrator. Uh, I know that a lot of this stuff must be en media res stuff and that I'd get more of the cadence of the voices and so forth if I read the first 112 pages, but from this page I do not feel a lot that puts me into the story. It's just very convoluted. <laughs> Next, I have Trespassing Hearts by Julie Ellis. It's an interlibrary loan book, and they like taped this uh, sheet into like the, fl the, the jacket cover, so I can't get it off easily, but eh. <laughs> anyway, I will read. They were all here, she suspected, like Mark and herself, to make connections. With a shock, she recognized the two women hovering over the piano and singing Begin the Begin. They were Ethel Merman and Tallulah Bankhead. Herman was starring in Cole Porter's new musical, and Bankhead was appearing on Broadway in Clash by Night. Don't you think Cole Porter is just the bravest man in the world? A statuesque young blonde cooed to Betsy and Mark, as the others in their group focused on individual conversations. After all those operations on his legs, and he's always in pain, he still writes such gorgeous music and lyrics. The short, dark man in the wheelchair at the piano was Cole Porter, Betsy realized in shock. Paul would be so excited when she told him. He'd said that while Cole Porter was in college, he'd had a show on Broadway. Paul couldn't wait for the war to be over so he could write his play. Even now, he kept making notes. Betsy made a pretense of listening to the conversation between Mark and the blonde, but she was really focusing on what suggestions Mark might make to Felicia about redoing her drawing room. Now Betsy eavesdropped on an older couple who appeared to be viewing the guests with condescending amusement. Darling, Felicia only has show business people at her parties, the woman said arrogantly. Now she's on a patriotism trip. Of course, all three of her husbands were Americans. All at once, Betsy's mind leapt into action. Felicia was on a patriotism kick. Then let them suggest she redo her drawing room in early American. Mark had a couple of fine pieces in inventory for the right price, she guessed. And with Felicia, that was no problem. Mark's contacts up in Putnam and Dutchess counties would come up with others. Perhaps that man they talked to up in Sag Harbor. Felicia was at the door again, welcoming a large, rather ugly woman in a flamboyant cocktail dress. Now this spoke to me a lot more. The sentences were much crisper and cleaner and you could tell exactly what the action was. And of course, even with a vague amount of knowledge that I have about the past, <laughs> I could tell that it was about sort of the golden age of cinema and Broadway, and I recognized, you know, the names of uh, Cole Porter and Ethel Berman and all of that. <laughs> so it really, uh, this really uh, stuck out to me, um, and uh, definitely is my favorite of the two pages. That being said, I decided to do a little more research into the books because I, as much as I liked the Trespassing Hearts pages, I thought it was, you know, a bit... Uh, simple, you know, and uh, that the other one felt more like it was part of a big epic sprawling story and uh, it's a much longer and so I went and I did some research and I found the Kirkus reviews and the Kirkus review for Sunday Jews was absolutely glowing or not entirely glowing. They said that it did drag on a bit, I believe. 
Uh, but then I found a review for Trespassing Hearts that said that it was, you know, just ridiculous and a stereotype and uh, just sort of drivel. <laughs> and then I went on to Goodreads and I found the exact opposite reaction. Uh, there weren't any uh, written reviews for Trespassing Hearts, but the uh, star ratings were kind of high. But the written reviews for Sunday Jews were all pretty low, all because it was kind of unreadable. And uh, one librarian in particular, I think, wanted it for her reading uh, group and it just nobody liked it. Uh, so, but it seemed to me like maybe it was one of those things, you know, like, you know, really uh, complicated literature can sometimes be difficult for a book club setting. I mean, my book club won't uh, even um, consider anything as long as uh, Sunday Jews. I mean, this book is uh, 694 pages. It's almost uh, 700 pages long. <laughs> So I felt kind of bad. Uh, I'll read from the back of Trespassing Hearts to give you an idea of why uh, uh, professional book reviewers might think it's a facile story. <laughs> from one of America's premier romance novelists comes a powerful saga about an act of passion that becomes a trial of faith. Set in New York during the turbulent yet glamorous years of World War II, Trespassing Hearts tells of a beautiful and principled young Jewish woman, thrust by love into the opulent prison of high wasp society. For Betsy Bernstein, Hunter College graduate and aspiring interior designer, the milieu of her first and only lover is, an is as alien as another planet. Paul Forrest is a wealthy Gentile whose mother, a grasping, mentally unstable socialite, will never condone his marriage to a Jew. But Betsy's pregnancy and Paul's departure for the war propel them into a hasty wedding without his family's prior knowledge or consent. Refusing to rear her newborn son as a Christian, clashing bitterly with her willful mother-in-law, Betsy must struggle in a society rife with prejudice, first as a widow, then as a mother and a successful interior decorator, and finally, once more, as a woman in love to be true to herself, to her child, and to her heritage. Rich in character and emotion, sweeping from the elegance of elite Manhattan townhouses to the stately splendor of Southampton mansions, Trespassing Hearts is Julie Ellis at her affecting best. So yeah, all of these uh, characters and the situation seem pretty one-dimensional. Like, you know, you got the bad guy wasps trying to, you know, suck the life out of this poor Jewish woman, and uh, she's just, you know, this struggling young uh, interior designer wannabe and has been swept up into things beyond her control. So I, I, I can see why, uh, critically, perhaps it's not the most uh, deep and thoughtful book. <laughs> At the same time, I'm actually uh, about to read a bunch of uh, literature I hope will be very deep and thoughtful, from the Wallitzer books to other books that I have coming down the pike, so maybe it's okay to take a little bit of time to read something a little light and fluffier. Like, I want to be in Betsy's corner, you know, cheering her on against her evil mother-in-law, you know, standing up for my tribe, the Jews, you know, all of that. This can be kind of fun, you know, it's romance, it's fluffy, and it's readable, because for as great as this book may or may not be, if the language is too convoluted to get into, then it's not really doing its job. And at least by page 112 on its own, I can say that this is not really standing up. <laughs> okay, now that I have all of that covered, I can get on to my reading. <laughs> I'll check in later this week uh, with what I think about Sleepwalking by Meg Wallitzer and uh, Trespassing Hearts by Julie Ellis. In the meantime, I hope you have great uh, reading plans for the weekend and the week beyond. Uh, and I have a guest now on my, the ledge of my, uh, my bed. I, I keep on hoping that you get to see Missy a little bit, but she is a uh, rambunctious cat who likes to skitter around, and usually she hangs out in the other room, so I don't know how much you get to see her. But here she is now. Say hello to Booktube. Okay, I think that's about as good as we're going to get here, so I might as well sign off. <laughs> Thanks so much for watching, everyone, and I'll see you next time.